hearts, with all of my heart. Discernings of spirits is the most important gift that you and I could have, especially in these last days. And I praise God for the gift, and I pray that you'll start functioning in the gift. And if you will stop uh, thinking things according to your own mind and, th and how you figure it out, interpret it to be, and ask, start asking God to show you clearly how things are, and give yourself to the ways of the Holy Ghost, you'll have good discernment, praise God, and have word knowledge too. Amen. Word of wisdom, it all comes together. Well, tonight I was just asking the Lord, you know, and said, Father, how do I take the very complicated subject of Revelation chapter 11, 12, 13, and 14 and begin to put it into a way that people can understand it and remember it? And I'm going to tell you, I, I believe that every true and honest and sincere person will give themselves to the study of what they are most interested in. And, you know, I hope and pray that the Bible and, and these subjects of the Bible captivate your interest so that you don't just guess at what you uh, think you know or just have a partial uh, set of, of, you know, parameters that, that you've, that you've determined or short list of information that you're using to make conclusions by, but you give yourself to a thorough investigation and study. Now listen, here is this. Th this is the way it is. You may start off believing a set of things, but if you give yourself to a rigorous study of that subject, what's going to happen is that list is going to change. Those parameters that you thought existed are going to be modified because you're going to begin to get greater insight. Now, um, the, the subject of end time prophecy is very important. It is, uh, should be very important to you and because at the very center of it is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That should be very important to you. Um, the issues concerning uh, the deception and and the signs of the time and the challenges that all of us are going to face as that day approaches should also be very concerning to you and of great interest to you so that you find a means by which you have a defense, you are sober, you're aware, you're vigilant, you're not falling into a trap that otherwise you would have been able to plainly see had you just given yourself to an earnest and rigorous study of the subject because Father has let us and caused us to know more about these things than what many people realize. He's left them, however, into the category of a very intensive study of giving yourself to the Word of God, but not just intellectually, emotionally, and giving yourself in terms of to the Word of God that you're living the Word of God, you're doing the Word of God. Now, if you do the Word of God and you live the Word of God and you're giving yourself to walking in the things of the Spirit, maybe the things that you uh, don't understand. I, I think that most people don't understand what it means to walk in humility and meekness and lowliness. I think that that is the case. But you give yourself to truly understanding those things and, and doing those things, the Holy Spirit's going to let you clearly um, grasp and, and live out that which maybe you don't even understand right now. And as you live by the Word of God, the Word of God will be unveiled to you. If you just take the Word of God for granted and you, you, know, you like certain dimensions of it and don't like other dimensions of it and figure it's okay for you to have perhaps a lot of knowledge about it but not a lot of doing, it's going to mess you up. Every bit of words you want to be able to do. The word of God that I preach to you tonight, the ministry tonight, I don't want you to forget it. So I'm going to take the very complicated subject of Revelation chapter 11, 12, 13, and 14. By the grace of God, I'm going to give you means by which to have a peg in the ground. I'm going to give you a means by which you can navigate. And if, if I can get you to navigate, then you're going to be able to not just... Um, Agree with me, perhaps, because you're good and you're, and you're uh, uh, a committed student of the word here in the abiding place. But 
These are things that you're going to know are most certainly true because the Word of God says it and you know it and you don't have to play a tape for somebody else to be able to understand it. It's in your spirit and you can communicate it also accurately. And I don't want anybody messing up with the book of Revelation. It's not a book to mess up with. I don't think you should mess up with any scripture. I believe that all scripture needs to be um, regarded with such reverence in our life that we're not going to add to it or take from it. I believe if you add to it or take from it, you're going to open yourself to deception. And that's why if you add to this word, the plagues of this book should be added to you. Of course, we really understand that when we're reading Deuteronomy. Moses said that with Deuteronomy. And we really understand that when we read the book of Revelation, because John also said it with the book of Revelation. And if you take away from it, your name should be taken out of the book of life. And I believe that really finds its outworking in the fact that you open up yourself to deception by not giving attendance to the word. So I really, I'm doing this study in the book of Revelation because I want you to be aware of the last day that you live in. I want you to be able to more clearly understand those things which God is holding us responsible for. Every bit of the word of God, whether people want to agree with it or not, you're held responsible for it. And the beautiful thing of it is, it's spirit in its life. People talk about the letter of the law. They really don't even know what they're saying when they use that word so many times out of context. I'm talking about the word of Jesus Christ, which is spirit and which is life. And the word of God, which endures forever. My goodness, there's nothing killing about that. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set you up with something that is very familiar to most everyone. And um, I don't have it in front of me right here. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. I'm trying to get used to ministering from my um, little iPad. And I'm not really good at it. Uh, so, I'm going to have you open in your Bibles to a very familiar verse of Scripture, and then I'm going to go back to my iPad. And, and the reason I'm not good at my iPad is because it doesn't navigate quick enough for me. And as soon as I start talking, I'll get hit with verses of Scripture that, um, you know, I, I haven't created links for yet. I'm learning how to cre create links so I can navigate quickly to ver from verses of Scripture, one verse of Scripture to another on my iPad. But I want, to, I want you to look at Matthew chapter 25 because I, I, I really believe that um, people are able to, to um, Matthew chapter 24, I believe that people are really able to connect with, with, with these verses of Scripture. And let me see. You're just going to have to excuse me for just a moment if, if I'm having trouble um, finding the, this verse of Scripture. Um, but uh, let's see here. Well, I guess good to think about it. But Jesus said that one of the primary things that we should be well aware of or understand is the prophecy that was spoken by the prophet Daniel in the book of Daniel uh, concerning the abomination that makes desolate. Now, if anybody can help me find that real quick. I know I can find it. I know where I can find it. I can go into Daniel and find it really quickly. But can anybody find that in Matthew chapter 24 for me real quickly? Verse 15. And I said verse 14, did it? And I couldn't find it. But that's what happens to me. I'm just staring right at it. can't find it. So Matthew 24, verse 15. When ye therefore should see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understanding, understand. Then let that man flee from, Ju from Judea into the mountains. From Judea into the mountains. I'm going to help you understand tonight that so that the book of Revelation, primarily beginning chapter 4, and especially going through up until chapter 18, up to first chapter 19, verse 1, really is so targeted and directed towards the nation of Israel for many, many reasons. But I'm not going to get into that right now. I'm not going to just jump into the wealth of information that uh, exists in those chapters. I'm going to give you a peg in the ground. 
And this peg in the ground is Jesus telling us, speaking of that last day and that last time. Now, some people are going to say about uh, the prophecies in the book of Daniel that I'm going to read to you in a little bit, and the prophecies that are also in the book of Revelation that also concur with this event. It's the same point of the same event. They're going to say, well, it happened long ago, and uh, it took place through Antiochus Epiphanes. No, Antiochus Epiphanes lived about 175 years, well, about 195, about, a, forgive me, 205 years or so um, before uh, Jesus said this. And Jesus is talking about something that's going to happen the last day after his time. So I want to get that clear. It's a very important peg in the ground. We hear Jesus talking about something that's going to happen in the last day. He's talking about, he's given us an understanding of how to now navigate with all of those things that the prophet Daniel said. And so I'm going to help you grab a hold of the timeline that Daniel gave us. He gave us an exact and a perfect timeline. Are you ready? Ready to go to some of these scriptures? So let's, let's go over to... Um, Let's go over to Daniel chapter 9, and let's just go ahead and start there. And I, I'm going to give my uh, iPad a really good chance tonight to, to perform for me. See if we can make this, make this happen, okay? Um, before I give you the peg in the ground that Jesus is referring to, let me just give you the overview of Daniel that you will find in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. This is the overview of, the la of everything that is going to happen on a prophetic calendar beginning with the days that Daniel was actually living in. As he was there in the transition from the Babylonian Empire to the Media Persian Empire. Next time we have the book of Revelation study, I'm going to put up for you all the images of the various different beasts, all the images of the various different kingdoms and their symbols and help you understand that and help you navigate from that point of view. Tonight, I'm just going to try to give you an overview, help you to be able to understand where you're at specifically in the timeline of the last seven years of the earth existing as it exists right now. Because at the end of this last seven years that Daniel talks about, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come and set up a kingdom to which there shall be no end. And his kingdom will crush and destroy all the other kingdoms of the world. Okay? And um, I know I can, I can help you understand that on a number of levels. Let me go ahead and give you a little parenthetical statement. For example... Uh, Daniel saw an overview, an image of a great giant, and he saw the image had a head of, of, of gold, and he had arms of silver and a, a breastplate and loins of brass, and then legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. And he saw this was the, as the kingdoms of the world from the time that he was living up until the, uh, really it's up until the seventh kingdom. There's going to be a total of eight kingdoms. And the seventh kingdom ultimately would be the feet um, with ten, you know, having ten toes, iron and clay, iron and clay. And the first one being Babylon, the Babylonian Empire. The second being the Medo-Persian Empire. The brass being the, th uh, the, which is the third being the Grecian Empire. The fourth being the Roman Empire, the, the, the legs of iron. The fifth being the um, empire that shall rise up out of that empire that's in the future. Uh, which we have uh, several ways in which we refer to that, but we refer to that uh, primarily um, as a revived uh, Grecian Empire and then the and, uh, Roman Empire and then the Eighth Kingdom, um, which is the Beast Empire. A lot of, stuff, a lot of information to retain, and I don't, and I don't want to get into that too much because I believe the next time that I... Begin to minister on this, you'll be able to understand what the seven heads represent, what the ten hordes represent, why the different beast, why, why a dragon in one instance, why a, a leper in another, in another instance. So I'm not going to get into that. I'm just going to, I'm going to back out of that. But one thing I wanted to say is that Daniel saw a stone which was uh, carved out by God out of heaven, and that stone was cast to the earth or thrown out of the heaven 
uh, by the Lord and smote the image at the point of his feet. Not his head, not his, his arms and breast, not his loins, not his legs, but at the feet. The last, in, the last of the empire, the last of the great kingdom upon the face of the earth, the Antichrist kingdom, and destroyed the image of the kingdoms of men. And it became dust, and the wind blew it away, and a place of it was found no more. There was no more kingdoms of men in existence anymore. And that rock or that stone that uh, Daniel saw uh, grew into an exceeding high mountain and filled all the earth, and he was speaking of the kingdom of God. And so, like I said, the next time we have the book of Revelation study, I'll spend more time trying to help everybody understand that because... When we get in to the book of Revelation, chapter 11, 12, 13, and 14, it really becomes a pivotal, pivotal point where a lot of information is given, a lot of symbolism is given that is clearly definable and understandable, but you're going to have to know yourself some information about Daniel, some of the other prophets. You're going to have to understand how to navigate through that symbolism, otherwise you're just going to go wrong with it. So let me help you understand this beginning in, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 says, Seventy weeks are determined upon your people. Now, this is very important. God is not saying 70 weeks is determined upon the Gentile nations. He's saying 70 weeks are determined upon Israel. This is a very important clue here. Okay, this is about Israel. And he says, and upon the holy city. So he's talking about Jerusalem. This is very important. Because if I give you a peg... And we have a peg in the ground and we understand now how to divide things up and how to navigate. Then we can recognize then at the same time what it's all about and who these events are being addressed to and directed at. Are you with me? So 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to bring an end to all of sin. Think about it. The Lord is going to have a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells only righteousness. That's what he's going to have. That's what Peter declared in 2 Peter chapter 3. This is, where, this is where everything's going. Jesus is going to come, set up a kingdom. He's going to rule with a rod of iron. He's going to smash everything that is rebellious, everything that doesn't want to obey God, everything that tra transgresses, every kingdom that tries to defy those things of the Lord. He's going to smash it. And he's going to bring an end to it. And of course, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24 says that once the last enemy death is destroyed after Jesus reigns and rules with the rod of iron, the last enemy death is destroyed. Then Jesus is going to deliver the kingdom up to the Father. And the Father is going to come and be all in all. It's at that point in time that we'll see the new Jerusalem come down out of heaven. <laughs> and uh, there, it's at that point in time that the Lord will make a new heaven and a new earth. And the, oh, the former things will not be remembered anymore. Isaiah said they won't even be able, you won't even be able to bring them to mind. There won't, there won't even be a thought about the former things. They'd be pass, so passed away. It would be like, it'd be almost impossible for us and the people in the future at that time to even consider that there was such a world as there is now in which transgression and sin exists. They won't even be able to comprehend what it's like to live in a world that is saturated by the prince and the power of the air, the spirit, uh, the God of this world, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. For he will be bound forever by that time. And so I don't want to constantly give you overviews because I think most people have got it that we're in the church age, the tribulation comes, then there's a thousand years that Jesus reigns, with his saints over the earth. Satan is then loose for a little season. And then there is one more great event where Satan tries to bring a rebellion and overthrow God. But that's the final one. And then the new heaven and the new earth. Um, now this is an overview that now looks at things a little bit more specifically. Daniel is agonizing because he knows Jeremiah had prophesied and said that they would only be in prison and in captivity because of their sin and iniquity for about 70 years. The time had expired. Daniel's seeking God, saying, what's wrong? Why haven't we had the deliverance? Why, hasn't, why haven't we been allowed to return to, to the land of Israel? He, he, you know, it's a beautiful thing 
when you know how to read the Bible and you can take the Bible literally, you didn't take it symbolically. If he would have taken it symbolically that Jeremiah was just, you know, mystically and symbolically and allegorically speaking of 70 years of exile, then who knows what he would have, uh, how he would have responded to God. But because he took the word of God literally, he says 70 years have come, the time is fulfilled, we're not delivered. He begins to cry out to God, he begins to seek God with fasting and prayer. And because of that, the Lord not only showed him when they were going to return to Israel to rebuild the temple, but he showed them everything else in a general sense of the events that would go down with the nation of Israel and his people. And that's what Daniel chapter 8 and 9 and 10 and 11 and 12 are, are really focused on. So he says 70 weeks are determined upon your people, the nation of Israel, to bring an end to to finish all transgression, to bring an end to sin, and to make a reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Wow. Okay? So here we are. Pretty simple. All we got to do is understand the 70, and we'll be on our way. Okay? And so he says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks. So he says, there is going to be a week of sevens that we'll take to restore the temple. And what's going to happen is this is the temple that God assigned under the um, direction of Ezra and Nehemiah to reconstruct the temple in Jerusalem. And it's going to take about 49 years to build this thing up. And it's going to happen in troublesome times. And... Uh, so he says, and then after that seven, after that week of sevens, 49 years, then there is going to be um, another trans period of time where there's going to be three score and two, and that's 62 sevens. There will be 62 sevens. So all you got to do is multiply 62 times seven, and you get your total number of years, plus that, add that to... Um, 49 and you come out to something like uh, what is it 483 you can correct me if I'm wrong okay I've been running all day here so um, about 483 years all total and and I want to I want to point out something it's going to be he says that there's going to be 62 weeks and then what's going to happen he says after three score and two weeks the 62 weeks so now a total of 69 weeks would have transpired are you with me Everybody with me? The Messiah shall be cut off. Not for himself, but for the people. For the sins of the people. And shall come and shall... And, and, and the people of the prince shall come and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. Now, I don't want, want to get into that one part, part, part yet. Because that's the last week. Three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. But not for himself. Okay? You with me? Now... The ASEANs had created the best time system and method of keeping time until modern days. And they did it really centered for the most part around the prophecies of Daniel. So they knew the very day that the Messiah was going to be cut off. They had, through their study of Daniel and some of the other prophets as well as other resources that they had that we don't have or include in the Bible, they were able to calculate the very day that they saw the Messiah being cut off. And they, and they understood it in a unique way. They thought that uh, the sons of light were going to battle against the sons of darkness and um, all of the powers of darkness would be overthrown and that they, as the holy people of Israel, got to participate in that. And then they would ultimately then be a part of ushering in this new kingdom uh, as Messiah comes to take up his rulership and authority over all of the earth as a result of this battle. Okay? Now, what happened is on the very day of Passover that they had already calculated it should happen on the Passover, they had it down to the down to the day, down to the hour. They had it down to the day and the down to the hour, really, 
when Jesus entered Jerusalem. Jesus said this is the time, this is a moment on God's absolute uh, time table that if you did not cry out and say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, if you would not cry out and welcome in the Messiah into the holy city, that the very rocks themselves would cry out because ultimately these prophecies have got to be fulfilled. And so what's going on now is, and I'll, let me say this, I believe, and I, 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 as far as I know, the majority of scholars believe that the 3,000 people that got saved on the day of Pentecost, they were the Essenes because they were wandering around going, wait a minute, there was no battle. We had this thing right down to the very moment, the very time, the very hour. And the only thing that happened was this person from Nazareth that said that, that, that uh, everybody was saying is a great prophet that they crucified for saying he was the son of God was crucified. He was cut off. And so now they're, they're wondering, wait a minute, they're reevaluating Isaiah chapter 53. And then we see the, begin to see the mention of, the, of, of those uh, folks that were of that persuasion, which we call the Essenes, or those who would separate themselves specifically for the event, uh, an eschatolo what we call an eschatological event, or the event of the, uh, the return of the Messiah. And, it, and what happened was, they didn't see as what they thought was going to take place, whether they see, saw a crucifixion, a burial, rumor of a resurrection, and now they're there on this moment of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, which there's other verses of Scripture that they would have been well-versed in because they, they spent a lot of time with the prophet Isaiah, and they would have been able to say, hey, look, this is that great moment of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. They, they were ripe for the picking. Okay? So... We've got, by the time that Jesus is cut off, we've got 60, uh, 69 weeks of the 70 weeks that Daniel prophesied, or rather the, the angel of the Lord revealed to Daniel concerning the nation of Israel. There's only one week left to be fulfilled. And when we talk about the book of Revelation, what we discover and understand is that is the final week. And we've got many proofs to establish that it is the final week of this period of 77s that the Lord determined upon the nation of Israel, upon the nation of Israel, very important point, and the way that he's dealing with the nation of Israel. Now, there has been a long pause in the 69th week, and people need to deal with this very important issue because. The 70th week cannot begin to take place until there is a moving forward with the finality of God's plan with the nation of Israel. The church wants to be right in the big middle of it for some reason. I have no idea why because it is nothing that um, is going to be good. And it's not about bringing in a great harvest. It is about God's wrath being poured out upon sin and iniquity because there is no more harvest left, if you would. And I know that the questions come up, well, how about the people that are getting saved? How about those that are referred to as saints? And I've addressed some of that, and I will address more of that. Um, and a lot of it, it really truly does focus on the bringing in of Israel, the removing of the veil, uh, that which was prof or spoken by uh, Paul in Romans chapter 11, uh, Israel being called back and God through these acts of uh, his mercy and grace on their part, bringing them back. But while the rest of the, uh, of the world, except for 144,000 Jews from the, 12, tri from the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, only the, uh, they're the only ones immune to all of the hell and wrath and destruction and turmoil that's breaking loose on the earth. So, keeping to the point, the book of Revelation, the last seven years, is about Israel. And that is why when we begin to read Revelation chapter 4 through Revelation chapter 19, we go back to Old Testament theology. We go back to Old Testament terminology. And it seems that Many people don't want to pay attention to that. They want to admit that, yes, it's the final seven. It's the final 
week of sevens that are spoken by Daniel the prophet, but for some reason or other, they begin to add things into it that really shouldn't be added into it. And, you know, I, I've given you a key to, in, to understand the book of Revelation. And I'm going to ask you, do you know what that key is? Does anybody here know what that key is? And that key is, that's right, Revelation 119, where the Lord said, write the things which you have seen. And what he saw was he saw Jesus in chapter 1, the revelation of Jesus standing in the midst of the churches. He said, write the things which are, and he wrote and addressed in Revelation 2 and 3, all that he did to the seven churches. And then write the things which shall be hereafter. And chapter 4 opens up with the phrase, these are the, now, these are the things which are hereafter. And that then begins this time clock of the 70 weeks, which are actually in the book of Revelation, as it is in Daniel, broken down into months and broken down into days. And I tell people all the time that want to be contentious about other arguments, well, if I'm here during the days of the abomination that makes desolate, where the Antichrist uh, that rules, which is called a beast, that rules, as it were, in the final kingdom, the eighth kingdom, and we see the day that he makes to, goes into the holies of holies and proclaims himself God. That's what that is. I can tell you the very number of days when the Lord will come. But Jesus said, no man knows when he's going to return. Only the Father in heaven. Well, I could tell you at that moment the very numbers of days, and I'm going to show you because what D Daniel does is he gives us the very number of days. We've got the very number of days in, in Revelation being 1,260 days. We've got the very number of days in Daniel where he extends it and says, now blessed is he that comes under 1,290 days. And then he brings out to another a, a total of 75 years, uh, 75 days rather, because of all the things that are going down in the transitions of the um, um, moving from the end of the seven-year tribulation and the battle of Armageddon to the setting up of the Lord Jesus' kingdom and the giving out and the meeting out of, of judgment and gifts and, and rewards. And, and that's a lot to talk about. I'm not going to talk about that tonight. I'm not going to talk about the difference between the 1,260 days, the 1,290 days, and the 1,335 days. I'm not going to talk about that tonight. We'll leave that for another day. I don't want to confuse you. But I do want to, I do want to intrigue you. I do want to interest you. I do want to inspire you to get to studying and putting your heart to these things and ask your father, well, Father, what does this mean? And you know what Papa's going to do? He's going to say, read more. And you're going to say, Father, what does it mean? And he's going to say, read more. And he's going to say, Father, what does this mean? He's going to say, read more. And then you're going to say, well, Father, what does this mean? He's going to say, read more. Okay? You got that? I just want to prepare you. Now, now he's going to talk now about the final week. And he's going to talk about, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. Unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Okay? That's the final week. He will confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, I'm, I can prove to you that we are actually talking about the Antichrist in the middle of the... Uh, well, we're talking about the Antichrist, first and foremost, in the last seven years of time on this earth as we know it. And so I'm going to help you see this. I'm going to help you navigate to be able to do this. Okay? Now, stay with me here with this last little bit. He shall, so, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Look at this. In the middle of the week. In the middle of the week. I'm going to go and show you in Revelation the middle of the week. And what God's going to do is he shows us when the Antichrist does this in Revelation chapter 13. And then gives us the total number of days left. 
until the Messiah comes. He gives us the 1,260 days, 42 months. He breaks it down. So very, very key passage. If you want to understand in time prophecy, before I can tell you why Moab and, and, and Edom and Ammon are spared and what Obadiah has to say about Edom in the last day, and, and before I can tell you more about the formation of this last um, great empire, the seventh kingdom and the eighth kingdom, I've got to get you to understand these very simple keys. I got you to get, I have to get you to understand that you're in the 70th week determined upon Israel the very last week, the last week of sevens, seven years in other words, and that the abomination that makes desolate that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15 happens right in the middle of that last week that is focused upon Israel. Does everybody get that? Does anybody believe I'm making that up? Because I'll stop and take questions, write it down. I'll have me take questions here in a little bit. Am, have I lost you? Have I given too many parenthetical statements? Do we need to do a review? Are you earnest about this? Are you going to get the tape and re, uh, you know, listen to the tape and look up the verses of Scripture and get this one point down? Because it gives you a peg in the ground. You've got to have this peg. Because you're going to have to have yourself some wisdom if you're going to understand, as Jesus said, let him who reads have wisdom and understanding, okay, concerning these events. And the only way you're going to get that is from the Word of God. Are you with me? Everybody here? Because I'm telling you, this is, this is a little bit hard for me tonight. Okay, this is a little hard because, and I know why it's a little hard for me tonight. I know why the challenges are because... I understand the value and the meaning of this to you if you get it. Are you with me? Okay, so. He shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease for the overspreading of abomination. He shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And, and, that, determined, and, that, and that determined shall be poured out. Shall be poured, that, and that which is determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. Now, he's going to defile the temple and it will remain defiled until Jesus comes. First to Edom, first to Bozrah, then to Armageddon. And then there's a number of things that are going to happen after that. As I said, I referred to the 30 days and the 75 days, which extend beyond the book of Revelation in the sense of what's revealed under the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowl judgments. It's more about the transitions that are taking place in Revelation chapter 19, which begins to set things into a whole different um, dimension in terms of what all's going on, who's all included, and, and, and it's far more widespread in, in, in its impact. I mean, everybody in heaven and earth and in hell. That's how widespread. So let me just take you back here for just a minute to um, Daniel chapter 8. And I just want to point out to you who this guy is that um, causes the daily sacrifice to cease. And what God does is he sets it all up in terms really of what's going on during the days of Daniel and um, the empires that are existing right around him because what was going on during his day Actually, um, there is a, a connection with, for example, the Grecian Empire and the Eighth Kingdom. The same demon spirit, and we can prove this to you in the scripture, the same demon spirit that ruled over Alexander the Great, gave him the power, angel actually, that ruled over Alexander the Great, will actually participate with um, um, the Antichrist. That should be uh, no surprise, seeing as uh, that's all part of the framework of of Satan's kingdom and the, and the powers of darkness that are working together in terms of uh, everything that opposes God since, since Adam uh, sinned. But what we hear is, and I'm not going to just read all this to you, I'll just more or less quote it to you and just give you an overview. In verse 10, we read about the Medio Persian Empire. And the Medio Persian Empire is represented as a ram. 
And uh, it's the empire of the Medes and the Persians, and one horn is bigger than the other because uh, the Medes and the Persians weren't equal in power. And um, one was greater than the other. And what happens is there is a representation of a goat with one horn that comes in his fury comes out against the Medio Persian Empire, which is Alexander the Great, the Grecian Empire, and he destroys, overthrows, and tramples to the ground, breaks off the horns of power, which all, horns always represent governmental power. Okay, prophetically, they represent governmental power. He breaks off the horns of that governmental power and then stamps the ram to the ground. That's the end of the Medio Persian Empire. And I'll give you, just for those of you who are wanting to keep up, it is the end of the fourth head. The end of the fourth head of the beast that has seven heads. There's seven empires that have oppressed Israel. And it began with Egypt, then Assyria, after Assyria, Babylon, after Babylon, Media Persia, after Media Persia, Greece, after Greece, Rome, after Rome. It's still on hold. It's the seventh kingdom that has not yet come. It's the first beast kingdom of the book of Revelation and also the eighth kingdom, which is the uh, second beast of the book of Revelation. The second beast kingdom, two beast kingdoms. Once again, next time, and as we study, I'll be bringing out all of this. I'll bring, I'll bring out the diagrams for you so you can see an overlay of it. And you can see the nations that each one of those heads represent because there's been all kinds of wild ideas espoused and it's completely, you know, conjecture when in reality the scripture is telling us what's going on. Now, something very important about that, that goat, that horn... Now, ultimately, that horn turns into four other horns, okay? So suddenly, God is, Daniel is going to connect the dots for us. He's going to go and he's going to take us over to the last day, the last and final week, the 70th week, and he's going to show us who the Antichrist is. And he's not going to connect it with what he says about Babylon. And he had many things to say about Babylon, the image with a head of gold. He's not connected with the things he had to say about the Medio and Persian Empire. And he had many things to say about the Medio Persian Empire. He's not going to connect it with the things that he had to say about the Roman Empire. And he had many things to say about the Roman Empire. He is going to connect it with the, the Grecian Empire. And that's why we refer to the Antichrist Kingdom as the revived Grecian Empire. He, that would be what we call the first beast of the Book of Revelation Empire or the Seventh Kingdom Empire. Now, those. I know that when you're hearing new information, you're going, give me a break, man. I mean, goodness gracious, my mind can't take any more information. But if you listen to it enough, you're going to get it. If you'll just hear what I'm saying, listen to the YouTube, break out your Bible, read it again, put the YouTube on pause, read it again, you're going to be able to see whether or not what I'm telling you is accurate or false, but what you're going to find out is you're going to find out that I've read this a bunch of times, <laughs> that I'm more than read this a bunch of times, that I spent a lot of time studying this, and you're going to be hard pressed to find out where I made a mistake tonight. And I just, you know, if I had a million dollars, I would say anybody can find where I made a mistake tonight, I'll give you a million dollars because it'd be worth it to me. Not because I just want to challenge you to prove you how to prove to you how you know knowledgeable I am, but rather it would be worth it to me because if I'm wrong, I'm telling you it's worth more than that to know it. So I want to get you to study these things. I do it whatever is possible. I'm gonna do that. So now listen. Yea, he magnify himself even to the prince of the host. Are you with me? Now look, I, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna back up. Verse nine of, of Daniel chapter eight. And out of one of them came forth a little horn. So I'm, I'm, I've taken you through the ram, representing Media Persia. The ram is now over. The kingdom of Media Persia is over. It's now been replaced by the Grecian Empire. Also keeping in mind that the 70 weeks that were determined upon Israel began in the time of the Media Persian Empire, right? I want you to remember that. If you didn't know that, I'll show you on a timeline. It was... It would, the edict was sent forth to, to rebuild Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple. The first seven sevens, the first 49 years that it took to rebuild the temple under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah happened under the Media Persian Empire. Media Persian Empire is gone now. Grecian Empire is here. The Grecian Empire now has ended. And we're now moving into a new phase. 
And now Father's talking about something that didn't happen back in 350 B.C. Are you with me? Or was it, what, 380? Okay? And you can correct me. You can find fault with my dates. But they're not too far off. Okay? 350, I think, is when Alexander the Great died. Isn't that true? Something like that. And, you know, it just kind of, no kingdom overthrew him. He died. So you don't see a kingdom overthrowing him like he overthrew Medio Persia. You don't see some other creature coming out against him like the he goat came out against the ram because he just died and it just sizzled, okay? And his kingdom was divided. So now it jumps over and it says, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to back up just so you get this, verse 8. Therefore the, the he goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and what came out was four notable notable ones and towards the four winds of heaven. In other words, four notable ones had an impact either in the north, one had an impact in the north, one had impact in the south, one had impact in the east, and one had impact in the west. And so actually what he's going to do is he's going to show us a grid so we can identify who the Antichrist is, where he actually comes from, what he's like. So he says... And out of one of them came forth a little horn. Now, I want you to import, it's important because the little horn is going to be identified to be the Antichrist. He's going to be the, identified to be the first beast kin, kingdom of Revelation. And also the authority in the, in the second beast kingdom of Revelation. The seventh and the eighth kingdom of both the prophet Daniel and also the book of Revelation. Which I said, like I said, I'm going to say it again and again because I believe repetition is a good teacher. I'm going to show you the charts and the diagrams and the pictures um, the, the next time we get together for the book of Revelation, uh, the Revelation study. So, here we are. And out of them came a little horn which waxed exceeding great. And it waxed, verse 10, and it waxed great, it waxed great not only to the north and south and east and west on the planet here on earth. Verse 10, it waxed great even unto the host of heaven. So we just now left the dimensions of that which is natural, and he's now functioning and operating in the seventh, okay? Uh, in, 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 or rather, in another dimension, which is the dimension of heaven, the supernatural. He's left the natural, he's operating in the supernatural. They're going to actually make an image of him, just like, you see, there's, there's certain similarities that the Antichrist has with the Assyrian Empire. I'm going to point those out to you. I want to show you the graphs and the diagrams and the pictures. There's certain, that's why in the prophets he called the Antichrist the Assyrian. And there's certain things that he resembles with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar made an image of himself and commanded the whole world to come and bow down and worship it. What's, what's going to happen is they're going to make an image also of the Antichrist when he steps in to his supernatural entity as the eighth kingdom. As a seventh kingdom, he's just like Alexander the Great. He goes and he conquers quickly. He conquers Greece, Turkey, Egypt. So I know where he comes from. If he conquers Turkey, Greece, and Egypt, I know where he comes from. There's only one left, Assyria. Assyria. And we see the formation of it happening at this very moment. We see what the, the, the only thing, the only division that's been keeping the uniting of all of these nations that form these ancient empires is the division between the Sunni and the Shiite. And we see it coming down. I used to believe that Islam was the... Um, I used to believe this back in the 70s. I believed that Islam was actually the, the great whore religion because I could trace Islam all the way back to Nimrod. And I could see it in every kingdom mentioned. And then the Lord showed me, no, 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 no. It's something far more sinister to that. It's far more intense than that. And I'm not telling. Okay, I've already got too much information to tell you anyway. You have to find out. You can come and ask me, hey, is it this? And I'll smile and tell you yay or nay. And if you got it, we're going to talk. We're going to sit down and we're going to have a conversation. Because I'm still all over this thing. I'm after this. I'm, I'm learning things continually. So I want to get you, I want you to help, help you with this, and it waxed great, even in the host of heaven. This is now he steps in the supernatural dimension. This is the eighth kingdom. You can be, you don't, you don't, if you can't understand that right now, just leave it on hold. Don't worry about it. Come back to it later because I have given you very simple things already that you can understand. And um, so, and he shall cast down some of, he shall cast down 
of the host and of the stars to the ground, and he will stomp upon them. Wow. Hey, this is a pretty radical power. Uh, one thing that I discovered long ago about the demonic realm and the, and the realm of the angels of darkness is they all hate each other as much as they hate us. they full of hate. There's no order. It's complete chaos. They're, they're, they're so full of pride. They're, they're always jostling. They're just, what you see in the outward form of their influence, how one kingdom rises against another kingdom. One king, you know, one, there's one coup of a king and another coup of a king. There's, you know, empires trying to conquer other empires. One king trying to conquer another king. All that stuff. It's just reflecting what goes on in the demonic world, what goes around on in the, in the angelic world. In fact, if I had time tonight, I would help you connect the dots where... Michael comes to Daniel and says, um, uh, forgive me, Gabriel comes to Daniel. No, it's Michael. Michael the prince comes to Daniel and says, we heard your prayers when you first started praying. But we were trying to come and the prince of Persia stopped us. Because over every king and over every kingdom is an angelic authority that endows that power to that kingdom. And so... God was trying through his prince, Michael, to give Daniel the answer to his prayer because he says, you're much beloved. When you first started fasting at the beginning of your 21-day fast, your prayers were already heard. There was already permission from heaven to allow you to be a part of the secrets of God's timetable. But we had to deal with the principality, the spiritual, the ruler of darkness, the spiritual authority that held this kingdom together, that, uh, that, that stood above the king of this kingdom. And we had no right, as it were, to break through. Gabriel came to help me. I left him over there with the prince of Persia, and I'm here now. So he's running interference while I'm bringing you this word. This is what it says. This is what the Bible says. I believe I was just quoting Daniel chapter 12. See, I have, you know, I, I haven't had the time today. I've been running really hard. I haven't had the time, unfortunately, to really do the refreshing I need to do. This stuff's in my heart. I can tell you pretty close to where the things, where it's at. I'm not going to be too far off. Because this is in me, man. I'm not reading some little script that somebody gave me. I want these things to be in you. God stamps these things upon our heart if we're supposed to be a part of it. And I've had a real struggle thinking, well, why aren't more people a part of this? Lord, it's just a select few of us supposed to get the job done while everybody else looks on. And that's still a question that's up in the air for me. And that all honesty, all honesty. Because I believe that we are able to do what we do based upon the grace of God that is given us. And, 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 and I, I understand that it, it takes obedience to cooperate with the grace. It takes obedience to move into another, as it were, dimension of grace. But I'm certain everybody's truly being fervently obedient. I'm just going to take the positive route. And the rest, I don't know. But I want these things. I want you to go after. I want you to hunger and thirst. Let God stamp your heart with the grace of heaven so that you can be a part of what's going down. So he, and he, he, stung, he, he brought down, really interpreted, he brings down the host. of. See, let me say this. When you begin to talk about the Antichrist and his authority and his power, he's a man. And everything he's primarily doing in the realms of the supernatural, Satan has given him the ability, not God. That should make sense to everybody. And so it's, when you're listening to some of the things that are, are being addressed as though the Antichrist is doing it, some of it is actually what Satan himself is doing. And in the Revelation chapter 12, we see that Satan is cast out of heaven. That means, and he's not cast out of the holies of the holies. He's not walking the streets of gold. He's not upon the crystal sea. He's cast out of the realm of the unseen. Because it's spiritual wickedness in high places, but it's in the bottoms, the lowest parts of the earth, truly. I could tell you some things about that, but I'm not going to. You know, and, 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 and I just catch myself sometimes. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not make-believing here. I'm not a pathological liar. I'm not a creative guy shooting from the hip making up a story. 
You know, I'm, I'm trying to tell you what I, what I have received from the Word of God, what is cru cr clearly that which is a product of being desperate about these things. I, I, I have, no, I have n no objective to be some great renowned preacher. I have an objective to rule and reign with Jesus for all the ages. I have an objective to see as many people make heaven as possible. I have an objective to, to smash and crush Satan at every point that I can. Okay? And somebody says, well, you know, why is it that you get intense? Because a lot of the things that I do, Satan comes out against it to stop it even when I'm talking. You know, and I just have to get after it. I'm just forceful. I'm going to get after it. And he said, oh, he's, he's too intense. <laughs> you got to come over here and kick in. I want to see how you act. Come over here and kick in. Come start being more of a threat against the powers of darkness. Come on now, kick into this thing. Move it forward. Come on now. Grab a hold of the kingdom of God and advance it with Christ Jesus. Advance it with the Holy Ghost. You're, you're going to come up against the prince of the power of the air. You're going to come up against the opposition by which God said, by the way, if you're going to do anything here, you've got to be strong the strength of the Lord and the power of his might and take unto yourself the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the tricks and against the devices of Satan. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers of darkness. And what we're talking about is some of the rulers of darkness. We talk about, you know, Michael, my goodness, the great prince, the great angel. Michael, who's, who's the, who stood before the Lord. And when, when, uh, when many of the other angels were ultimately deceived by Satan, who, who also stood before the Lord beholding God's face for eons, and Satan was able to deceive them and lead them into transgression and rebellion, Michael stood fast. But Michael himself, having to deal with these rulers of darkness, was, was, was hindered, was stopped. Gabriel came to help them. And, he, and, and, and as Michael said, he's there with the prince of Persia now. As though he's, he's holding them off so I can get to you. Think about what you and I are engaged in. Think about what you and I have been given in Christ Jesus. This authority to deal with this, this, these things that Satan is doing. And he's deceived so many people to believe so many things that the Bible says nothing about. And I'm going to tell you, your pastor, your favorite preacher, your favorite theologian will not be standing by you on that day defending you at the court of heaven. The Lord said, my word shall judge you in that day. And when we grab a hold of the reality... <laughs> That he has given to every man the ability to know. The very simple difference between life and death, good and evil, darkness and light, Satan and God. There's going to be, no one will have any excuse on that day. We make believe things to accommodate whatever we want to do. Huh, we're going to have to get out of that. I'm talking to you about the very depths of iniquity. The very inter -work, inner workings of Satan's strategy, where then all of a sudden it becomes completely unveiled. Satan is cast out of heaven, comes down to the earth having great wrath because he knows his day is short. And not only now is the wrath of God being poured out in quantifiable ways, where, for example, when the first bold judgments go down, I might. The, the sea is turned to blood, and every living creature in the sea dies. There's not a species left. <laughs> when you start quantifying all of the results and the impacts of the seven seals and seven trumpets and seven bowls, that's bad enough. That's a wrath of God directed against sin. That's how he feels about it. God's not happy all the time. He's not in love with everybody. His anger and his wrath burns against sin. He will hold people to, a, 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 to be a given account. He will chasten. He will correct. In his mercy and his grace, but his judgment's there too. If people think that God is happy with them while they're fornicating, they know they have mixed him up with Satan. Because he's not. <laughs> and I can take you to many places in the Bible and show you. Uh-uh. Come on now, people. You better get a hold of your body. <laughs> you better get a hold of your life. So not only is this wrath being poured out by God directed at sin. Some people say that God doesn't feel that way about sin. Oh, yes, he does. That's what this is all about when you read the book of Revelation. Not only is his judgment and his wrath being poured out against sin, but now Satan, in the middle of the week, 
in the middle of the week when we just read when that moment in time when the Antichrist, that little horn that came up out of the Grecian Empire, there's many things, as I was saying, that he also looks like in terms of Alexander the Great. Because Zeus can easily be a word that fits perfectly Lucifer. And the descriptions of him and the cults around him, the ancient cults around him. And when you go to Mount Nimrod and you look at the images of Mount Nimrod, which was right there at the very heart of the worship during the days of Nimrod. <laughs> Come on. He's, ah, you're talking Greek mythology. Now you're getting weird. Hey, man, where did they get it from? Hello. Listen, angels came down out of heaven and began to cohabitate with man. Read about it. Genesis chapter 6. There's more going down than what people realize. Listen, Nimrod wasn't building some little ziggurat up in the heaven and saying ultimately that we're going to enter into heaven because we're going to build a tall, tall, tall building because we all know that they would have at one point just basically asphyxiate it fell over dead because there's not enough oxygen hello God said what they're doing nothing shall be prevented of prevented from them doing it we got to stop them there was interaction going on in a spiritual world that is now being unfolded to us in the book of Revelation that you and I are pressing hard against and if you're not feeling it and if you're not seeing it it's because you're blind. It's because somehow you've been overwhelmed by other things. I'm telling you. I, start, I said, okay, I'm going to go after the book of Revelation. I'm going to start preaching end time prophecy because I see not only more and more deception being preached, as it were, from the pulpit, lullabying people into a place of completely being unaware of their day and their time. But because I want people around me to get it. I want them to get engaged in this warfare, in this battle. I want you to see and, and smell and taste, as it were, the game that is afoot. In the words of Shakespeare. Huh? Come on now. Come on, somebody, get, somebody say, uh, or uh, or amen, or something. Somebody move. Somebody, come on, get radical. Don't make me be radical all by myself. I look like a crazy man. Being evaluated by a bunch of psychiatrists. Come on now. Enter into this thing. Come on. Enter into this thing. You can't you, you have to get your emotions involved in serving God if you're going to convince me that you know him. I'm telling you right now, you got to prove to me I want to see a witness. I have a right to see a witness. <laughs> Amen. I'm a fruit inspector from heaven. Yes, he magnifieth himself even to the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Come on now. This is not Antiochus Epiphanes. Listen to me. We're talking about the seventh kingdom. This, we're talking about the seventh kingdom and the last week of sevens. We're talking about the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel. Jesus referred to it. Matthew 24, verse 15. It's pivotal. you got to understand, I've got some connection. I've given you some connection. I've given you a peg in the ground. I've given you the ability to understand where you're at on the timetable of God. Whether you realize it right now or not, as you begin to give, give yourself to the study of this thing, you go, aha. Uh -huh. and, and you start, if you've got a peg in the ground, you know, and you start venturing out to do something, you won't get too lost. You can go back to your reference point. And if all of a sudden you're out there and you're wandering around and you can't find your reference point, exactly, you went way off base. Uh, go back over there, get you your reference point, tie a rope around it, tie a rope around your leg, and now start venturing out and exploring. And then that way when you go too far, you'll get it caught and you'll have to come back over here into the parameters set by God. Okay? Hallelujah. So, let me just kind of, let me kind of just emphasize this. Verse 12. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice. 
by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. And I heard one saint speaking to another saint, saying unto the certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation given to both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto him, uh, two, He said unto him, Two thousand three hundred days. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, real quickly, um, I want to go to uh, Daniel uh, chapter uh, 9, verse 3, 22. Go to verse 22. Now, that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, speaking once again of the horn, the, the little horn, okay? Out of one horn came a little horn, having a big mouth, and spoke great blasphemies against the God of heaven, okay? So I just told you a little bit about one of the horns. Yes? I'm sorry, I'm 822. I said 922, forgive me. I'm in Daniel chapter 8, verse 22. So I'm just really trying. One, here's, the two, here's my two objectives. I'm going to say it. Maybe I can say it better. My two objectives. Number one, to tell you where the abomination of desolation takes place, to give you a peg in the ground, and tell you and identify for you who does it. So I can set you up to understand how the kingdom's um, ultimately fit into the framework of what he's doing and why the various different symbols are given of uh, the Antichrist and given of these beast kingdoms in the book of Revelation, which, which I know is, is very challenging for people to understand. Now, that, now I'm going I'm to just back up to, back up to verse 20. The ram which you saw having two horns, he's going to tell us here, right? Because for, for it was symbolism, right? So, the ram having two horns are the kings of, of Media and Persia. See? No guesswork. So, so, somebody said, wow, how did he discern all that? There we go. Because I just read on. I just keep reading. And I really wanted to set this up for you to help you understand that the Bible is going to answer its own symbolism. Right? So, and the rough goat is the king of Grecia. So he didn't name Alexander Great, the Great, but we know who it was because we know history. And this is where you have to study a little bit of history as well so you can get these things. Because we know that's exactly the series of events that took place. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king, Alexander the Great. Now that being broken off, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of that nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time, key word, of their kingdoms, when the transgressions are come to full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Once again, we're talking about the Antichrist again in the context of the Grecian Empire, in the context of these four divisions that are now basically given by symbol of four horns. And the power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, and he, shall do, and he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy, now he's destroying the mighty and the holy people. I want you to keep, keep, I want you to keep track of that. We're talking once again about Israel, the people of Israel. And through his policy also shall he cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall... And, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of, of princes. Speaking of the Lord Jesus. But he shall be broken without hand. Just walk you through a couple more verses of scripture here. To hopefully get this established. Um, I, wanna, I want to... I want to take you over to Daniel chapter 12, I believe, real quickly. And, and on the way, I do want you to take note where the Lord says again in Daniel chapter 10, verse 14, Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall your people in the latter days. Once again, the second time he says it. Actually, it's more than the second time he said it, but a very, it's a very, um, it's spoken with, a very, with very strong emphasis there. You with me? Everybody get that scripture down? It's really important. 
Then we're going to jump over here to the book of Revelation here in just a minute. How do I, how am I going to? Let me just start in verse 5, chapter 12. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on the other side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard a man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and, he, and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that lived forever. And it shall be for times, time, and a half. Now, we'll see this in the book of Revelation also. It's the only other place we'll see this terminology used. And it's a terminology that refers to three and a half years. It will be for a time, time and a half. And we shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people. All these things shall be finished. And the he that he's talking about is the Antichrist that was referred to earlier. Now, I want you to see verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. And the abomination that make desolate set up. There shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Very important verse of scripture. It's a key verse of scripture when I go and read to you these things in the book of Revelation. Otherwise, if I just went into the book of Revelation tonight and I started telling you what the meanings of the things were in Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 13, you might be impressed. You might be going, wow, that's interesting. Uh, but how do you know that? I'm hopefully giving you tonight the ability so that you yourself can begin to conceptualize this in the realm of your thinking and now understand how to build all prophecy around the singular most important event. How do I know to do that? Because that's what Jesus did. He built end time prophecy around the singular event, the abomination that makes desolate spoken by the prophet Daniel. Let him that readeth understand. Okay? In other words, let the person who is doing the reading in the book of Daniel and understand what Daniel is talking about and have understanding concerning how to put the events together because this is the key pivotal point that lines everything up. Because if I've got number of days and number of months, are you with me? If I know the number of days left at the middle in the last week of sevens, then I know exactly where I'm at and where the number of days, the number of days that have already expired and how they're laid, a, laid out. And then I not only know the number of days, but I know that it's broken out into months. There's no reason for us to be saying that this is anything less than chronological because it is so chronological, it is down to the very number of days and then extends out to more days, giving us more specific information of other things that are taking place that go beyond the scope of what God showed John in the Isle of Patmos. Because John was only allowed to see the 1,260 days. Now he's going to say, so John saw the 1,260 days from the day, from the abomination that makes desolate. Daniel's talking to us about the 1,290 days. Okay, see that? And then he goes, blessed is he that waits and comes to the 1,335 days. Praise God, I got that. I remember that one. Thank you, Lord. I give him all the credit. Amen. Hallelujah. Anything I remember, it's like a miracle. <laughs> he says, but go your way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the day, in thy day. Hallelujah. I get excited about this. I get excited about thinking about the definite and absolute details of God's plan that is already set and nothing can change it. And when you begin to understand, a lot of people have tried to take the book of Daniel and make it like it was written, you know, after all these events. Daniel wrote these things and it is provable. 
Daniel wrote these things before they ever happened. He wrote what happened in Media Persia before it ever happened. He wrote what happened to the Grecian Empire before it ever happened. He wrote about what happened to many of Alexander the Great's generals before it ever happened. If it all happened just like he said then, all the rest is going to happen exactly like he said as well. So therefore, if I really give myself to understanding these things, I can tell you what's going on right now in Syria, Iran, Iraq, and Turkey. I can tell you what's going on around the Aegean Sea. I can tell you why these certain things are happening in that hot spot of the earth and hopefully get you to cooperate with God instead of being led about by propaganda and stuff from CNN. Because what I'm going to do is I'm trying to get to a place where I can begin to talk to you more than just on a fantastical level more than just on a sensational level about what's really going on right now and how it fits with the rise of the great Babylonian empire that will be the center of all trade, will be the center of all commerce, will be the capital of the world. People sit around in America and act like it can't happen. Listen, America has been the capital of the world for a very short period of time. And just like all the other nations collapse, believe it or not, America is not the utopia of the kingdom of God. It's going to collapse too. And the writing is upon the wall right now. We have made choices. We have declared God is not our God. We have made choices and declared that we do not have to be bound to His divine laws and divine order. That his holy estate of marriage that he brought forth when he formed Eve out, Kava, out of the very side of uh, life of Adam, to be more exact, is it right? Now we can have man with man, woman with woman, Romans chapter 18, God says what it's going to end up like. He lays it out, Romans 1.18, women burning in their lust for one another. Men taking the use of a woman, laying it aside. God said, I'm, I'm, I'm going wrath burns against it. Read it. Read it. Then go back and refer to Sodom and Gomorrah. Then go back and refer to, you know, <laughs> that right after Balaam has hired Balak, I mean, Balak has hired Balaam to prophesy for him and He's prophesying under the inspiration of God. The Father says, I will not regard transgression, nor behold iniquity in Israel because of the covenant. Then Balaam said, all you got to do is get them involved in sexual immorality and God will depart in the curse of fall. And it happened. So Balaam taught Balak how to cause Israel to stumble so that the plague of death would be able to overthrow them and praise God for Phineas, who was a zealous preacher that knew how to properly use a javelin. And God said, your name and your priesthood will stand before me forever because of this righteous judgment in your life and in your heart. And we're going to have to have a revival. We're going to have to have a turn to being on God's side because what's going on right now is a whole bunch of hanky-panky with Satan. And demon spirits. We don't know whose side we're on. <laughs> we want to stand where all the great masses of people congregate and just say, Be happy. Be happy. Be positive. And be blessed. Because God loves all of his creatures. It's not true. God so loves the world. But I'd like to hear your theology about how much God loves Satan and Lucifer. I'd like to understand about how much God loves Lucifer and how much God loves these angels that will kill and destroy. And I want to understand how God loves those people who have, with total abandonment, fallen out to their iniquity. Come on now. 
I mean, there's, there's something wrong with that theology because we're missing out on his, on his wrath and his judgment that abides upon un, all ungodliness. You know, Obama's on the radio, I'm on the television saying we've got to go cut out that cancer, ISIS, up there in northern Iraq. Me, my goodness, people, why don't you start applying that to the rest of sin and iniquity? See, if it's a sin you don't like, you damn it to hell. But if it's a sin you like, you say it's in heaven. And you've got to understand, if we could get Obama to open up his eyes to realize that the iniquity that he's opened up in this nation by allowing a man to marry a man, a woman to marry a woman, and who knows what's next. Somebody's got to marry their goat, I'm sure. And that's got to be allowed and permissible. And somebody's got to be able to marry, a man's got to be able to marry a little boy, and a, and a grown woman's got to be able to marry a little girl before it's all over. Because that's where it goes. It's a Pandora's box. It's pandemonium by definition of the word. It's the release of every unholy thing. It's true. It's true. The moral decay. And people need to wake up if they can see, if they can see the unveiling. See, the book of Revelation is an unveiling. It allows us to see what Satan's really like, what he really wants. He wants all the world to worship him. He said to Jesus, fall down and worship me and I'll give it all to you. It's mine. And to whomever I give it, it's my right. And that's where the unveiling brings us, where Satan demands that everybody worship him. And the Antichrist, both in his form as the first beast of Revelation, the second beast of Revelation, the seventh kingdom of both Daniel and Revelation, and the eighth kingdom of the book of Revelation, is all about bringing all humanity to worship at the foot of Satan, to receive in their forehead or in their hand his tattoo saying, I am the slave of Satan. I've sold my soul to him. I believe people are selling their souls day in and day out. Good. Paul said in Romans chapter 6, he that serves sin is the slave of sin. He that sinneth is of the devil, John said. People need to get real about their battle and stop saying that somehow Satan is more powerful than God. That, that Adam's transgression more effective than Christ Jesus' obedience. That the spirit of the devil more influential than the Holy Ghost. That's nonsense. It's nonsense. It has stripped everyone of their ability to withstand the power of the enemy. It's taken the faith, the shield of faith away. foundation be destroyed where shall the righteous stand that's all about making everybody sinner read the context I'm here I'm here blowing the trumpet I'm here I'm happy to pay the price I haven't had to give my life for the message yet <laughs> but there's been times I thought I was sweating blood Blessed is he that waits and comes with... Okay, I'm, I'm going to the book of Revelation now. I'm almost done. I've gone over time, haven't I? See, because I can't get through all of this. If I could get you to leave out of here tonight with a peg in the ground. Matthew 24, 15. The peg in the ground. The abomination that makes desolate. That you can go then into Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 9, chapter 12, and then see more details about the abomination of desolation. And exactly... You know, where that's at in the framework of the 70 weeks that are determined. And we showed you tonight. We showed you that it's right in the middle of the seventh, right in the middle of the week. Three and a half years in, you go. Three and a half years to the day, to the day, to the year, to the month, to the day. To the year, to the month, to the day. Let me prophesy to you. To the very year, to the month, to the day. Into, the, into this moment of time called the tribulation and then we can understand the very month and the day in which the Messiah shall come and the, what all of the prophecy is directed to and how it's directed then all of a sudden you and I are, are going to be able to cooperate with what God the Holy Ghost is doing right now 
If we understand what's coming, if we understand what's in the heart and mind of God, if we recognize the enemy and the opposition that we're up against, we're going to be able to move more effectively and do exactly what God has willed for us to do because moving in the will of God is knowing what's in Father's heart. Wisdom is knowing what God is doing and doing it with Him. And Father has not, un Father has not veiled that to His friends. Huh. Hallelujah. Father has not veiled that to His friends. To his friends, he's revealed everything. And the Holy Ghost has revealed everything, continues to reveal everything as we walk with him. Revelation chapter 12. I've got to just try to wrap this up real quick. And it's, do you think that you got this? Do you think that you got the 70 weeks? Do you, do you feel you got the 70 weeks? Do you, can you say from now on, I know that the tri book of Revelation, the tribulation is about the last seven determined upon the people of Israel, upon thy people, as the angel said, your people to Daniel, who's from the nation of Israel. And you understand that 69 has been fulfilled, and now during the church age, it has not functioned. It's been on hold. For 2,000 years, there is a 2,000-year a gap between week 69 and week 70. And the more you study the book of Daniel, and especially, you can even see it in the English language. Look at literal translations, but more clearly even in the Hebrew language, in the Chaldean language, you can see that there is a space and time. You can see the continuity of the first 69 weeks. And then it's like there's a big separation and a breaking off point. And then it's as though that last and final week is hanging out there, standing all by itself, surrounded by a whole unique group of events. And that's exactly where we're at. And people are going to have to wake up to the reality of that if they're going to begin to understand the book of Revelation. It's like everybody wants to do a nice thriller, high, you know, high uh, intensity kind of service. And, you know, everybody's all excited and feeling better and shouting and screaming, dancing around. And, Ooh, praise God. And, we're, and, and they don't want to get down to the nitty gritty of understanding. Look, there's a labor here of commitment and faithfulness to grab a hold of what God's saying to us. And there is a power of darkness doing everything that he can possibly do to to stop the word of God going forth, to kill the anointing before it grows, huh? and to deceive the entirety of the world, and the church is his primary target. And he's very effective if he can overthrow and deceive angels who beheld the face of God for eons. What can he do to you and me? Somebody said, oh, I'm a saint in line. The power of the Holy Ghost is around me. Satan can't touch me. Hey, listen, you could say the same thing about the mighty host. The angels. Now, perhaps if I would have gotten over here to Revelation quicker, you'd have been able to hear more of the same terminology. And, and I, but the, if you'll study it more, if you'll give yourself more to the reading Daniel and going to the book of Revelation back to Daniel, you'll see the same t kinds of terminologies are being used. So wh what time is it? How much time do I have to do this? What time is it? 827. Okay, I've gone 27 minutes over. I'm going to try to wrap this up. First and foremost, um, I can't tell you about the sun-clothed woman, but I can, I, can, I can point out to you real quickly. I'll tell you more about her later. Um, but what I, do, what, what I would like to say is this, that um, Genesis 37, 9, that whole vision, that symbolism, was actually interpreted by Jacob. It's part of Joseph's dream. Okay, so, but I'm not going to go into that right now. And um, now I want you to recognize here, number one thing I want you to show you here in, in verse um, 6, is I want to put you on the time scale here, okay? And the woman fled into the wilderness where, where she had the place prepared of God. And I can show you in other prophets where that is. I can show you exactly where it is. I can show you where she's going to go. I could show you exactly where she's going to go. Pretty radical, huh? Hang on. That they should feed her a thousand two hundred and three score days. Mm. Wonder what's going on now. There's one thousand two hundred and sixty days left. Well, we understand, by and large, that all we need to know is: Are we at the middle of the week here? And when we in Revelation chapter twelve and thirteen, are we in the middle of the week? 
We know what's going to happen in the middle of the week. Abomination and desolation is going to take place. Sounds like to me that we're in the middle of the week because it's using a very important number for us that helps us to understand when the finality of the seven uh, years or the last week is going to take place. So we're in, this is the first clue right here that we're in the middle of the tribulation. First clue. That we're in the middle or that we're in the middle of it. There's 1,260 days left. We heard about that already on in terms of 1,290 days, which takes us 30 days beyond. I'll talk to you about that later. And we also heard about 1,335 days. We'll talk about that later as well. Okay? Are you, are you interested? And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not. Neither was there place found in heaven for them. The great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and the angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now, now has come salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused us before God day and night. And I'm just going to try to jump over here quickly to, towards the end. Verse uh, 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast out, I'd be happy to give you the symbolism on this later, what it means. When the, when the dragon was cast out, uh, and when the dragon saw that he was cast out, forgive me, into the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child, okay, which is the 144,000. I'll prove that to you later. And to the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time, a times, and a half a time. Where do we hear that? Where do we hear that? Right after the middle of the week was identified, with respect to the abomination that makes desolate, that same Hebrewism, that same time scale symbolism was given to help us understand how much time was left before the end of that seventh week and the fulfillment of all that God had promised and planned to do in the nation of Israel and the Prince of Heaven coming to set up His kingdom. Okay? Everybody here with me? Okay. Good. She was nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth opened up the, opened, and, and the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Let me tell you what that means real quick. What happens is, it, it, is after the Antichrist goes and conquers Greece, he conquers Turkey, and he conquers Egypt. He comes now with his great host of armies, and he has made a covenant with Israel. And for three and a half years, he keeps the covenant with Israel. At the middle of the week, he breaks his covenant with Israel. He comes up with his armies to destroy Israel, sets himself up in uh, Jerusalem, in the Holies of Holies, saying, I am God. Antiochus Epiphanes put a statue of Zeus in there and said, Zeus is God, Satan is God. Okay, but he's going to go in and he's going to say, I am God, worship me. And as soon as that happens, all of a sudden Israel is going to realize that they've been duped. They've been partnership with the wrong person. See, Jesus said, I, I am your own. I've come unto you and you receive me not. One who's not your own is going to come unto you and him you're going to receive. They're going to receive the Antichrist. They're going to look to him and actually consider that he's the Messiah. And, and, and they're going to make a peace. He's going to have a covenant with them and a peace treaty with them. He's a, a Jewish Assyrian person. And, and there's a lot of things that we know about him because we know he forsakes the God of his fathers. And, 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 and I could go through a list of things about what we know about him. That's why Israel is going to look at him. They're going to pay attention to him. They're going to actually think that he's, got, he's going to have too many things about him that is good typology of the Messiah. Ultimately, he comes, sets himself up in the holiest holies. He says, I am God. All of a sudden, Jesus said, when you see this, Matthew chapter uh, 24, verse 16, flee into the mountains. Don't even go back to your house to get anything. Run for the hills because there's going to be t such turmoil. But listen, what happens? So he's now set himself against Israel to destroy Israel. And, what, and he hears a rumor, the kings of the north are now going to come down against him. And so what he does is he, this is the earth, oh, this is the dragon, Satan's the dragon. He pours out a flood to destroy the woman. And that is being realized to the Antichrist with how he swiftly takes over all of these nations in three and a half years. Now going to destroy and sack 
Jerusalem, but now the Antichrist has the kings of the north ready to make war against him. So he turns now to go battle the kings of the north. It takes him three and a half years to finally finish up his warring against Gog and Magog and, the, and, and against, um, the, you know, well, not Gog and Magog, but against those nations of uh, around the Baltics, you could include you could include the Soviet Union, you could include uh, Europe, you could include um, you could include uh, potentially even the kings of the East, but clearly all the kings of the North. Then it takes him three and a half years to conquer all of them. He comes now with a great host. Uh, the it's the oh, what is it? It is the sixth bowl judgment that dries up the Euphrates. Forgive me. Yes, that dries up. The, the, the rivers, the river Euphrates, isn't that true? Three demon spirits go out of the mouth. Three unclean spirits go out of the mouth of one of the angels. If, if I'm saying this correctly, I believe I am. And it goes to deceive the kings of the east, to draw the kings of the east into the battle as well. They come marching dry sod over the Euphrates River. Nothing, no river standing in their way. They now join all of the host of the Antichrist who is now referred to clearly as, as, as Gog and Magog. But understand, Gog and Magog has to be more than just a, a notion or the idea of Russia because Gog and Magog will ultimately come up again at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. And we know that the ge geography of everything has changed by then. So it's another subject, can't talk about it. But I'm just trying to help you understand what this symbolism means when the dragon opens up his mouth, pours out a flood to destroy the woman and the man-child, and, and what the earth does to open up, swallow up the flood to protect the woman and the man-child, the earth being the kings of the north now making war. At the end of that three and a half years, at the end of that last three and a half year period, the end of the seventh year, seven years, now Satan, I mean, the Antichrist comes down with all of these kingdoms that he's conquered, and now they are coming up to fight against God to ultimately destroy Israel and to fight against God, God, and that's ultimately where we uh, understand the Battle of Armageddon is at, okay? And i just try to say this one other thing real quickly, as I catch my breath. And I just say this, uh, and I've got to jump right in here to this, and I'm going to save it for next time, because I want to be able to set you up, help you understand the various different symbolisms that, uh, that uh, the beasts that are being described clearly identifies who the Antichrist is and, and what association he has with former kingdoms. But right now I'm just going to jump into this in verse 4 of Revelation chapter 13. And they worship the dragon which had given power to the beast, and they worship the beast. So they worship Satan because we've already, Satan's already been, the dragon's already been identified, right? Revelation chapter 12, the dragon was identified, that serpent, Satan, the devil, okay? They worship Satan, so you can now actually, you're, you, it's legal for you to superimpose Satan or the devil there where dragon, the dragon is. They worship Satan, the devil, which gave power to the beast, which is the Antichrist kingdom. It refers to the Antichrist kingdom, and he's referred to as a beast, and there's reasons why. It connects him with other kingdoms and purposes and things that are a part of this full... Uh, unveiled strategy of Satan that's been going on since Adam fell, since, since the things that went down that we clearly see in Genesis chapter 6, the things that were then exemplified with Nimrod, very exciting stuff, but I can't tell you about it later. Now I'll tell you later, okay? And the worship, the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given to him. This identifies him, this mouth, okay, identifies him. It's another clue. It identifies him with the little horn that had a mouth that spoke great blasphemies against God that we read about there in the book of Daniel that was associated with the Alexandrian Empire, which then ultimately is associated with the geographical location of who the Antichrist is and what nations he's going to grab first. And when you look at what's going down, and you understand this, all of, the, all of these events really began to be set up only in modern times. Because until oil was discovered in the Middle East, it was just a bunch of Bedouins running around with swords uh, and fighting with each other. Big deal. Okay, who cares, right? Right? Who cares? And by the way, if you're going to uh, you know, have to confront some 
you know, great superpower. It's a great place to have a battle out there in the sand kind of thing. That's about it, right? Oil comes on the scene. What happens? All the nations of the earth turn their eyes to where? The Middle East. Where do they turn their eyes most to? They turn, the, they turn their eyes primarily to the heart of the Assyrian Empire. <laughs> wow, interesting. They turn their eyes towards the heart of the great Babylonian Empire. They turn their eyes towards the heart of the great Medio East Persian Empire. So we've got to help you understand the connectivity of all these other kingdoms to the Antichrist because there's a number of very important identifications that go on because the Lord wants us to understand the tactics of Satan, the devices of the enemy, so that we can deal appropriately with them. Because I don't know about you, but I'm here to execute Father's will on the earth. I'm here to do it just like he does it. Hallelujah. I'm here to engage in a battle. I'm here to stop Satan. I'm here to take the souls out of his nasty, filthy hands. Hallelujah. And that's called, and the only way you're ever going to do that is consecration to God. Because if Satan can pull you out with his devices, you have no power over him. You're not casting out devils. The devil will be casting, kicking you around. I'm not letting no devil kicking me around. And no devil kicking me around. Just no, no, we're not doing that. Now, here's the third clue. I want you to know where we're at. Here's the third clue. He, a mouth was given to him to speak great blasphemies. And remember, in the, at, at, when he begins to make the abomination of des that makes desolate in the middle of the week that I read to you there in Daniel chapter 8, it continues unto the end, continues unto the end of the seventh week. Look at this. Mouth speaking great things, blasphemies, and powers were given unto him to continue 40 and two months. Guess how, many, how long 42 months is? Three and a half years, 1,260 days. I know exactly where I'm at. You see me? You see, are you with me? Are you with, can you feel it? You understand it? Now you got a peg in the ground. If there's anything I wanted to do tonight, and, and, and I know people tell me all the time, Mark, you give way too much information. Sorry, I'm way excited. There's a lot of information to give. Believe me, you should have heard what I wanted to tell you. You should have heard all the stuff I abbreviated here, that I jumped over, that I felt in my heart was very important information for you to be able to get to understand what I'm trying to tell you. That I said, no, I can't do that. I want you to be so filled with the Word of God. I want you to be excited about the Word of God. I want you to recognize that prophecy is something that God has given us the grace and the right to have if we want it, if we're zealous, if we're hungry and desperate to be a part of what God's doing, to be in the, in the middle of His will and plan. Come on, it's here for us, man. Why be occupied with the nonsense and the filth that's going down when you can walk around in the majesty of His divine glory? And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme of the name, his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. That is the desolate, the abomination that makes desolate. Now I want to show you something. I don't know how many people on the web stuck with me, stuck with me through this. Because now this is a key point to really grabbing a hold of the book of Revelation. Nowhere in the book of Revelation that Jesus come right out and say, this is the abomination that makes desolate, that was spoken by the prophet Daniel. He makes you work for it. He makes you give yourself to understanding Scripture. That's the book of Revelation. You, he's not... God has chosen not to spoon-feed us through Revelation chapter 4 through 19. And if there's any point that exemplifies it, it's this one simple point. It is easy to understand that we are in the middle of the 70th, 70 weeks determined, the 70th week of the 70 weeks determined upon Israel. And that this is the event of that abomination that makes desolate. But you would have to have been thoroughly, I spoon fed you tonight. You would have had to study for years to understand what I just gave you in an hour and a half. And I hope you're thankful. I hope you're appreciative. I hope you're blessing God. Say, oh, wow, man, we got this. We got years in an hour and a half. Praise God. I'm going to go back and I'm going to do the YouTubes and I'm going to search this thing out and see if we can find a, a way to help 
uh, Pastor Mark understand it more accurately. Amen. And I'm going to stop there. You know what I'm saying? I get so excited about this. I, I am so, ex I'm so excited about prophecy. I started studying prophecy at a very young age. I'm so excited about prophecy. I could do prophecy all the time. And the, Lord's, and the Lord doesn't allow me to do it. He doesn't allow me to do it because he wants me to deal with people right where they're at. When I preach, I preach right where you're at. I don't preach over your head. I'm going right in your business, and that's why it's uncomfortable. That's why I don't feel good. That's why people, you know, said I was happy before I came to church, and now I'm sad. And it's all for the purpose of seeing you be tried by the Word of God. Hallelujah. Conformed to the Word of God. To shine a floodlight. To shine a floodlight. Wherever there's light, reproving's going on. Amen. I want that pakasia la makelo. Hallelujah. I have the Holy Ghost walking around telling me all the time, son, that's good. You're doing right. Now, don't, not, don't do that. You can do this. But don't do that. I have him reproving me, correcting me, convincing me, convicting me. And I tell you, I want everybody here to have the same thing. And I know that if you don't have the Word of God in you, if you bought into lies, if you bought into compromises, you will shut down and quench the conviction of the Holy Ghost. And that's ruination. That's one step towards apostasy. So I'm just after this. I love you. I mean, I, I, I should be obvious. Well, I'm screaming and yelling. It should be obvious that I love you. And um, now... I'm going to open this up for any questions and...